going on everybody got back out here in the shop uh, i've got some work to do on the old uh, concours um, just some routine maintenance tires brakes fluids that kind of thing but first off in this video i want to thank every one of you we hit the 1000 subscriber mark i i don't have any like giveaways or whatever i just want to personally thank you all i mean this just it's a starting point for this channel. It gets me to the point to where I'm monetized. I could make a few dollars here and there. So, I mean, you might see a few more pop-up ads from, uh, from the Google um, AdSense or whatever through YouTube. So you might see a few more of those. Hopefully you can still hit the skip option and get through those. And obviously, if you watch through those ads, I get a little more, um, a little more kick on the side if you watch them, but I don't watch them myself when I watch the YouTube channels. So, um, Thank you all again for hitting that subscriber mark. I hope to get some more content out. It's going to be kind of hit and miss all over the place. It's going to be with the little bit with the KLR, a little bit with my wife's bike, probably a lot more with the concours. Uh, I'm going to try to get some touring uh, videos in. Um, I had a, I did a trip over the Memorial Day weekend, and I'd planned on taking some a bunch of content. And I took a little bit. I may still. Um, I may say I'll edit that and put it out, but I didn't take as much as I wanted to. Um, I'm also, I'm starting to use my new uh, camera here. This is kind of the first video I'm going to use it with. Um, I got the little microphone going on here. Hopefully all that comes out better, get a little better sound. I know it's a little echoey in the garage here, but it's just me. It's just me doing a hobby. Um, you guys know that I'm not the type that's going to sugarcoat things. I'm going to tell you how it is, what it is. Thank you all for getting us here and hell let's let's keep it growing um so today i'm out here in the shop i've got some work to do on the concourse as i said yeah i'll get her up on the lift and i'm not like i said i don't do how to's i don't do you know tutorials i i, I dabble a little bit in it but this isn't going to be a start to finish how to video but i will explain what i'm doing how i'm doing it and uh, we'll go from there all right first things first let's get the big girl up on the lift Excuse my grunts and groans, but as you know, she's a heavy biatch. Try to get my center stand off of the little plate. There she goes. Got her up there. All right, that was way harder than it needed to be, but I'll bring you in here and show you what I got going on. So, as you can see, got my Harbor Freight lift here. Run her up on the ramp. I got the little stoppers here. Got the little stoppers so she won't slide away. So essentially what I do is I get her up on the center stand here and I try to get it in front of that plate because that plate is removable for if you need to get the back wheel a little lower. Put it up on the center stand and then I just run stabilization um, like a little triangle uh, strap through my uh, uh, bike lift holes there and do that on both sides and I put a strap on the center stand to keep it from collapsing I mean this thing I'm not I'm not gonna be one of those guys that says it ain't going anywhere but she's pretty solid with the lift and I can give her some pumps now and get her up in the air <coughs> These lifts are rated for a thousand pounds. I've had big um, victory touring bikes on this bike lift before. I've had uh, K1600s. Uh, I loaned it to a cousin of mine and he had his touring Harley on it. So they're pretty capable of lifting what they say they're gonna lift. The old Connie here with dressed out the way she is now is probably 
I don't know, I'm pretty sure it's got a full tank of gas. It's probably pushing 700 pounds. Take the ramp off the back, stow it away. And a safety bar. I will tell you this lift does bleed down over time. I've never had it collapse or anything, but it will bleed down. So safety bar is a good idea. Some guys will lower it on the safety bar. I just leave it full height. Just walk around, give her a couple pumps every now and then. That's it. She's on the lift. She's ready to work. So what am I going to be doing to the old girl? So I got a few things happening. First off, she needs a front tire. She's not gone yet, but it's getting down there pretty good. Um, I need to check out the brakes, the front brakes on it. I'm going to go ahead and remove these reflectors after many years. I'm tired of looking at this little bit of rust that's starting to build up on it. It's looking pretty bad. Honestly, I only kept those reflectors on there uh, as an annoyance to my friend because he hated them. I kind of disliked them too, but it drove him crazy. So uh, <laughs> left them on there. Now they're getting rusty. I'm going to service or take them off. I am going to service the drive shaft. Um, this bike has 90,000 miles on it. I've never serviced the splines on the drive shaft. Kawasaki says it is not a serviceable uh, item. I mean, it's a serviceable item, but not a required service item. Um, but it's, it's got a little bit of clunking. I don't know if you can hear it. I don't know if you can hear it past the, uh, the brake rotor dragon. Just a little clunk, clunk, clunk as it spins around there. And that's usually a sign that the splines are getting a little dry. Nothing's bad, nothing's broken. And I've heard that they, uh, they've all do it, they ignore it, but I would, I'm gonna give her some service and I need to give this bike some love. So I'm gonna service the splines on the drive shaft. I'm gonna change the diff oil, probably doesn't need it, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Rear tire's fairly new, it's only got one trip on it. I am gonna check out the rear brakes. Um, Changing the oil on it, probably a little early for that too, but I am gonna do it. Another thing I need to service is the master cylinder. It's starting to get, as you see, I pulled that back almost all the way, and now it doesn't go back all the way. So the first pump is always a little squishy. I think I'm gonna start off by flushing the brake lines, bleeding everything, and um, going from there and seeing if it fixes that issue. But if it does not, I will be rebuilding the master cylinder, which is the original, I've never done it. So 90,000 miles on that. And, you know, bleed the brakes on this side as well. Front and rear bleed. I need to get the seat off and the master cylinder is up underneath the seat for the rears. So that's it. That's uh, all the work I'm gonna be doing. Oh yeah, one more thing. My little switchbacks here. Um, you guys watch my, uh, my video. I'm not sure where my key is. Just went on vacation and I lock my keys up when I go on vacation. So my switchbacks are starting to fail. I mean, it's been eight years and 50,000 miles. But you can see that one is failing. I think there's only like one element that's lit up and then it flickers. Should be lit up about like this side is. And it's only lit up that much so i have another set of those i'm going to put on those are fairly inexpensive so i'm going to look at them as a wearable item for those that don't know switchbacks you have your turn signals when turn signal goes off the running light comes on gives you a lot more visibility on the road so i have another set of those and while i'm in there replacing those i'm going to get to the air filter all right so front tire removal on these is pretty basic and straightforward that there is a couple little tricks guys um, tend to use and um, I mean the biggest thing is use your center stand that's uh, going to be step number one but there's a couple of things you have to do um, just to get the front wheel off without removing your front fender so 
if you want to take the what do you want to call it the uh, long way or the hard way or the most uh, time inclusive way just put it up on the center stand you can either just pick up pick up on your front end and stick a block of wood or something under your header pipe i mean it's pretty lightweight you can pick up with one hand the weight of the front of this bike when it's on the center stand if um uh, if you don't like the weight it's too heavy throw you a, a block of wood or something up on the uh on the uh, back rack and that'll help counterbalance it a little better too but as you can see i've got a little motorcycle lift here just underneath the header pipe it's kind of hard to see if i can get down in here there you go yeah just a little lift and you jack it up and the front wheel comes up off the ground i do have my straps a little tight here so i'll probably have to loosen those up but as you can see the front wheel is now off the ground um, the problem with that is if it's on flat ground and you ha still have your rear wheel on you won't have enough clearance to get that front tire out from underneath that front fender. So, I, I mean, the proper way, if you want to call it that, would be to remove the front fender, which it's not a lot. It's got a couple bolts on both sides and your hoses to deal with. But um, the, uh, the get around is if you're doing both tires, if you're doing a front and rear tire together, once you have the rear tire off, you will have enough clearance back there to cantilever enough to get that front wheel high enough to get that tire out from under that front fender. Another thing some other guys do if they're not removing their rear tire is to put a two before underneath the center stand as you're putting it up. Drive the uh, bike up on a two before or two by six, two by eight or whatever, two inch thick board, and then set a uh, two before underneath the center stand raise it up and then pull the two before out from underneath the wheels and then you have that extra tall clearance the other way is what you see i have here with my bike lift is it is a removable panel so when i jack the bike up that rear wheel will sink down into that panel and it gives me enough clearance if i can te teeter it back Oh, I got my straps too tight right now. I have to loosen those up just a hair. But that's the couple ways you can get around it. So just center stand, little jack or block of wood, take your front fender off. Everything comes off fairly easy. Put a two before underneath the center stand. That gives you enough clearance to teeter the bike back to get your front tire off without removing the front fender or remove the rear wheel. That'll give you enough teeter action to get it off. Or be fancy like Applebee's here and uh, have a stand that has a removable centerpiece. So that's a couple ways that you can get it off and thought I'd share that little tidbit of information. So once you have the bike up and supported and the front wheels off the ground, as you can see, I could actually go up a little higher, but I think, I don't know, I got a good three or four inches in there. Really only need two tools to take these front wheels off. Um, one of them is kind of a specialty tool, but they can be found pretty cheaply on Amazon or uh, eBay or any motorcycle shops, um, shopping website. So the first thing is you need a six millimeter Allen key to fit the pinch bolts and also the caliper bolts. Um, and the other thing you need is a 22 millimeter hex, which is, I use this socket right here. It's kind of a universal axle socket. Um, I use this 22, 22 millimeter um, one right here. As you can see, it fits right in this, right into the socket, uh, the axle there, and that's we'll spin the axle out. The other thing I have is my six millimeter Allen key. I'm using a socket on an impact. I'm only using these impacts to remove. Do not use impact to install. You will have a bad day. Also, it's good to know that these bolts on the pinch bolts and the caliper are very soft. Make sure you have a tight fitting Allen key or socket. Uh, I do have a set of snap-ons here. I'm not a snap-on whore by any means, but get a quality set. The cheaper ones tend to uh, round out these bolts on these bikes. Ask me how I know. I've replaced a few of them over the years back before I had quality tools. But um, 
that's pretty much it. So release the pinch bolts, release these two pinch bolts, not the ones on the left side, the right side pinch bolts. This is the axle side. The other side is just a nut side. It can stay in. There's a, uh, you don't need to take these out. Just back them out about a third of the way or so, and then remove the two caliper bolts on both sides. Then, then slide the calipers backwards. You can um, support them or just let them hang a little bit. I mean, there's not a lot of weight there. The proper way is to support them, but I've never had that any issues with just letting them hang. But you know, use a bungee cord or a coat hanger or something. Gonna do this, kind of do this in real time so you can see how quick this is. So pinch bolts. And that socket says, that impact says no. Da, da, da. Oh, there it is. So I over tightened these the last time I had them off. No surprise. All right, that's loose. Still just loosened up with a quarter drive sock ratchet, so it might have been a little snug, but they weren't ridiculously snug. Kind of the key to these bikes, too, is, um, you know, obviously you want a torque wrench and want to torque things down to spec, but if you're using a quarter drive ratchet on most of these fasteners, as long as you're not, like, putting all your effort into it, you're still not going to over-tighten them. So now that I got those loosened, we'll back these out some more. Back the mount a little over halfway. The ones in the caliper. Oh, removed completely. The caliper will just slide off of the rotor. A couple little wiggles in there. Try to catch it on this side so you can see how easily it comes off. Oop, lost my socket. Bolt number one. Bolt number two. Just kind of give her a little wiggle, slide back, and she'll, she'll come out and hang her. Like I said, there's not a lot of weight there. It's a pretty stout hardware in there. I'm not worried about leaving them hang. Then I come over here. I do have this on an impact. I don't know if it's going to come loose or not. We'll see. And just spin this axle out. She, say, she says no. Big dog out here. There she goes. The good thing about these, uh, these little um, specialty axle tools is you have the one that you need on one side, and then you can put a socket on the other side and uh, be able to take the, take the uh, axle out using a big wrench or another impact or something. All right, axle spun all the way out. Just reach in, support the wheel while you pull the axle. She pops out just that easy. You have two spacers, one on each side. Don't lose those. And then hopefully I have this supported high enough. Just kind of lean it off to one side. Nope, I need to go a little bit higher. Put a hand on it so I don't... There, is that high enough? And that's it. Wheel is out. So two pinch bolts, four caliper bolts, an axle. And she's out. Like I said... That rear wheel goes down into that stand, and that's how I'm able to get the clearance to get that front wheel up. As you can see, I don't know, maybe you could tell from the video, but I had just about two inches. There's probably about an inch and a half, two inch of drop there to get that out, which if you run the two before up on your center stand, it gives you plenty of clearance. So that's it with removing the wheel. Um, I'm going to go through and check these brake pads. So while you have these off, you can look in there and see your brake pads plain as day. 
both sides. Um, and I am, I'm going to mount my own tires here. All right, guys, this is why you do maintenance. So after I got that front wheel off, as you can see, I had to dig into her just a little bit further because I've already wiped some of it off, but I don't know if you could see, but I have a fork seal that is leaking. This is all wet. You can kind of see the smudges to my finger a little bit. Um, a little bit of wetness. Uh, sorry, I'm not very good at this fucking camera. A little bit of wetness down here on the uh, bracket, a little bit of wetness on the backside of the caliper. And that is not from fork um, brake fluid leaking. That is from the fork seal leaking. A little back here, a little wetness there, a little wetness there. As you can see, the right one is completely dry. There's no oil leaking on that. Um, so you can take a couple different routes I can go here. I did look in my records. The last time I changed these fork seals was... 2013 at 56,000 miles where I replaced the original fork seals at that time and I did replace them with OEM fork seals. So realistically, these fork seals shouldn't be leaking yet. Um, what it could be, and this is kind of evident of that, is you can see some of this like road debris that's on the bottom of this left fork here. You can see I, I, I'm, I'm able to polish it off. So, and you can tell that that fork has traveled down to the bottom of where that debris is. So it's also probably happened on this side. So what will happen is this debris will get built up on the bottom of this tube. And then I keep my suspension fairly tight, but I still, you know, as you can see in that left one there, I still use almost all of its travel. That's as tight as I can get it. So it is what it is. So while you're riding, this tube gets pushed up into this tube. And if it gets down here where all this debris is here, I'm trying to get the camera to show it, it gets down all this debris, it will get pushed debris up into these seals. So the seal I got pushed down right here is a, it's a dust shield and it's supposed to knock off any kind of debris, but it's only can do so much. It's not your oil, your oil uh, seal. Your oil seal is up in here being held in place with uh, retaining clips. So what I'm thinking has happened is I've gotten some of this debris from down here up into the seal. So there's a company called Sealmate that makes this little tool and it's just essentially a piece of plastic that you can work around the seal and just, you know, you can spin your fork around, work around the seal, go up and down in the seal and try to work out. It's in the shape of like a little hook and you can go around and try to dig any of debris that could be stuck in that seal. Cause it's just essentially like a, a double lipped oil seal. And if you get just a little speck of something, a, a, a pebble or a, a piece of twig or leaf or anything, you're, it's gonna let oil pass. It's a very tight system and that's probably what's going on. So before I pull the uh, trigger on ordering new fork seals and tackling that job, I think I'm either going to get that little seal mate tool or I am going to just make one out of a, uh, a soda bottle. I, we don't drink soda around here, so I'm going to have to probably go over to one of my kids' house and grab one or, you know, any such bottle, Windex bottle, anything you can just cut it out of. If you, and I'll, I'll put a link in the description of what it is. It's called a seal mate uh, fork tool, I guess, if you want to call it that. Um, they're relatively inexpensive, two or three dollars or something like that. I'm gonna try that first. So that's where I'm at. As you can see, I had to remove the rear of the front fender to get a good look at all these seals and stuff. Um, I'm going to uh, I'm gonna pull these both down, both of these. Um, I already got this one down, but I'm gonna pull these uh, dust shields down. I'm gonna spray some cleaner, some solvent up in here, take a rag, clean this all up, get it all pretty, and then I'm gonna work that fork uh, that fork seal tool around and see if that helps and I'll go ride it for a week or two I don't have any big long trips planned uh, obviously you don't want it to get any worse because what it will do is you know it's a good thing you have left and rights but what it will do is it will soak your caliper and your brake pads and your rotor and you know your brakes will 
suffer because of it. But that's where I'm at right now. Got that all off. Going to get it cleaned up right now. I'm still going to go ahead and mount everything. I'm going to clean it up, use the tool, and uh, I've got the uh, new tire sitting over here. And I'll cover a little bit of that when I mount the tire. So, all right. All right, I got that all done and cleaned up. And as you can see, here's my little tool. I just found a, it's actually a piece of a uh, container for brake pads, I think it was. And I just took a pair of scissors. It's a super skinny piece of plastic. Cut a little hook into it. Try to keep all the, uh, all the edges nice and clean so it didn't like have any frays or anything. And let's see here. As you can see, I got it all back together and cleaned up. So just to recap, you carefully put a little tiny screwdriver in this fork, this dust seal, and it will slide down. And then you take your home laid little tool and I'll just slide it up in this. I don't know if I can even slide it in this dust seal because I got it pretty dry. There you go. As you can see, I have that up in that dust shield. Now you're going to get it all the way up in here into the oil seal if you when if you actually need to do this so you get it up there and you just use that little hook and I, I i sprinkled a little bit of lubricant on it just some krill oil you can use wd or whatever just to help slide it up in there and as i worked that around i was just trying to pull out any gunk that could have got built up in there and then as you can see i cleaned the bottom of the forks so they're all nice and clean uh, you could stroke the fork a little bit with your hand and you know just try to just work it up and down, work this in and out. Do it a couple, do a couple laps, maybe once in each direction. And then uh, take a paper towel, get any crud up in there, use a solvent. I use, uh, I use a kerosene or charcoal lighter fluid. This is some of the best stuff you can keep in your garage. Wash your hands with it, clean parts. It's essentially a very mild kerosene. It will not, I'm sure there's some things that'll hurt, but I really haven't found anything that it will hurt uh, to date. So, um, yeah, I uh, got it all cleaned up, wiped it down. And then I, uh, I pushed a little bit of, a uh, little bit of silicone grease up in there next to the seal, just pushed it up in, wiped it out, got as much as you can. Now with that silicone grease on that seal, you're going to see a little dampness, you know, on the, on the fork for a little while. But I, I like to do that, especially with the silicone grease. Uh, I'll show you what I use on that. It is just a, uh, brake lubricant it's it's simply just a, a clear silicone grease uh, so that works really well on seals and keeps them rejuvenated or whatever I cleaned up the dust seal cleaned up all the shafts so we are all back together um, while I had it off I went ahead and took my my uh, brake pads out of the calipers clean those up with some brake clean just some good old-fashioned brake clean and a brush and I use a pan there's the pan I use Here's all my brake pads laid out. I think I am going to go ahead and order some new brake pads. These aren't done yet, but they're pretty close, so not going to hurt to put new pads in. I did have my old set of pads that I took out of the toolbox, and I measured a couple of these. You know, I got the caliper out here, measured a couple, and I'm going to put the thickest ones I have back in, but I am going to go ahead and, and replace them all. So that's where I'm at right now. I'm going to go ahead and put that fender back on. Um, because I'm pretty confident I've got a quite a bit of crap out of that. Let me see if I can find the little towel I had. Um, yeah, it's kind of hard to see. But, I mean, this is kind of some of the crud that came out. Um, there's this, oh, there it is. That's the spot. Like that's some of the crud that came out of the left fork. And the left fork wasn't even the one that was leaking. So I'm, I'm confident that's going to fix my problem. If not, if I see it leaking again, anything looks wet in the future, I'll go ahead and order some fork seals and get those on the way. So right now I'm going to put, uh, put the fender back on. And then uh, I got my tire changer over here. That would be next on the agenda, as well as replace the TPMS sensor battery in that wheel. So that's where I'm at now. So this little tool is worth its weight in gold, in my opinion, especially if you have a touring bike and you go through multiple uh, tires a year. 
Um, not going to go into super detail about this, but it's a Nomar tire changer. It's a manual tire changer. It's essentially just a stand and a clamp and a set of tools, but this thing I've had for many years and it's paid, saved me hundreds of dollars of taking my bike in and have somebody else mount the tires for it. So, like I said, I'm not going to go into super detail on how this works. I'm just going to kind of cover the basis. I didn't do this bike last time. Normally I have this uh, bike, this thing set up for these tires, but first thing is obviously just like any tire change is pop the valve stem out. One's on the Connie here. It can be a bit of a bear. Oh, I got a tool that's a little bit long. One tool's a little longer than the other. I had the shorter one there. And she's being a pain in the dick. Oh, no, she's not. She's coming out. Chalks forward. This is a bead breaking tool. And you work your way around. All these tools are coated with a uh, mylar or a nomar as they call them material. They won't scratch rims. I'm not saying it's impossible to scratch rims, but unlikely. The old concourse wheels here, we got to watch out for the TPMS sensor that's inside. But it takes a little bit of effort. But once you get it popped, just work your way around. I do the spot where the TPMS is last. And then that just tucks in and out of the way. Move this chalk back to where it was. I always put the TPMS over here to my right because that's the last spot that the uh, that gets mounted when you're pushing the tire the new tire on. These blocks are cammed, so Let's see if I'm getting it in here just right. All right, one more little shove. Locks in, turn this one, uh, and that wheel is locked onto that stand. This is a uh, lubricant. It is a, uh, I think it's a uh, um, soy or soybean based uh, lube. It comes in a paste. You can take a couple spoonfuls, mix it with some water, and then you make the spray. It's all part of the kit. If you buy the kit all as a one, one uh, shot. So this little tool, you can see it. It's kind of a cammed tool. Sometimes I use a little tire spoon just to reach in there and get it started. Pushing down this, push the opposite side of the tire down into the drop center. And then that side, it's underneath, and that side's popped up. Bring the travel arm around. Yeah, I gotta readjust it here. I did a, must have done a different bike last time. Some bikes you might want to pop your, um, I don't want to pop your seal out of your wheel, but I've, this one's not too bad. It doesn't really get in the way too much. So she walks right around, set the bar down, raise your pivot arm over again, then repeat for the other side. Now you just kind of got a fish down between the wheel and the tire, 
Grab the opposite side of the tire with that little cammed tip. And repeat the process. Drop this down, lock it in place, and then walk this around. Simple as that. Now obviously dismounting is way easier than mounting a tire, but that is so simple. As you see, tire's off. She had a few miles left in her. It's getting pretty cupped. I think I have six, 7,000 miles on this front tire. She lived her life. So before I, before I mount the new tire, this uh, front TPMS sensor has been coming up as low battery here lately. So as you can see, there's the TPMS sensor. And uh, this is the old style for the uh, concourse. The new style has a uh, encapsulated uh, sensor. Um, the old style are pretty easy to change the batteries in. There's plenty of videos out there on those, but uh, I've replaced this one quite a few times. Um, let's see if I got these little batteries in here. Put the wheel down so I don't drop it. You can buy these little batteries on eBay. Uh, there's a couple of different styles. Some have uh, terminals on them, some don't. I have a set with terminals on them. I'll get in the picture here. So you can see it's just a standard little watch battery with uh, pre soldered terminals. And I just have to crack open that sensor and go in there and solder some new ones in. I'm pretty sure that's a six millimeter hex on here. Yep, six millimeter Allen or hex. A little tight fit. Hold on to both sides as you spin that off. Be careful you don't let the, there is a spring in there that could go flying. Spin that all the way out. There's the spring and the sensor, and then the and the post that goes stays in the wheel usually, but it kind of wiggled out for me, so I'm going to just go ahead and take it out so I don't lose it. Done with this wheel for a moment, and I'll show the sensor. This is the sensor. This is the stud that stays in the wheel. Have a spring sensor itself and then the backing nut so the only thing I need to change the uh, battery is this you could tell I've had this one apart before I broke one of the little tabs on it so I slapped some tape around it don't lose that number because there is a way if you have that number you can um, buy new ones without paying Kawasaki they're over inflated price for them so I'm going to stop the video, take this apart, put a new battery in, and go from there. All right, I got that sensor all soldered up, and I didn't record any of it because, honestly, I don't have the patience for that kind of stuff to try to record and, and show you guys. There's videos out there you can find that show how to do it. There's also easier methods now with these new... Um, Mazda sensors and an Altel that you can program your own. So there's plenty of information out there. So I'm back to mounting the tire to show you kind of how the Nomar wheel stand here works. So got the Connie front wheel here. There is a rotation, proper rotation for these front wheels. On a non-ABS model, I'm sure, I mean, Kawasaki wants to mount a certain way, but I'm sure it doesn't hurt. You probably don't even know if you mount it backwards. But on an ABS model, you have your, uh, your pickup cog for your ABS sensor on the right side. So you got to make sure that's proper side. So if you ever mount a tire or somebody mounts a tire for your Connie and all of a sudden your ABS light's on, chances are your front wheel's on backwards. So a couple different ways. You can just remember which way it rotates. Make sure the uh, cog sensor will be on the right side with the tire rotation. Or there's also on the spoke of the rim, 
there is one spoke of the rim on one side, there is a arrow that points in the rotation direction. So your tire should also be marked with a rotation sensor or direction indicator. This one is counterclockwise. There is a yellow dot on this particular tire. This is a RoadSmart, uh, Dunlop RoadSmart 3. They put the dots on. The dot is the lightest side of the tire. So what you want to put the dot where your valve stem is. Um, some tire manufacturers do it, some don't, but it helps in the balancing. So for mounting tires on these Nomar stands, lubrication is the key here. They, this, whatever this uh, lubric lubrication, lubricant they sell, I, like I said, I'm pretty sure it's water-based, soy-based. You can wipe it right up with soap and water. So I try to lube up the face of the wheel with a good coating of it, about two thirds of it around. And it's the two thirds away from me, like the eight o'clock to the four o'clock position. And then likewise on both edges of the tire too. You don't want to get too much of it in the, uh, the bead of the tire, but on the inside edge. So on, on the first edge you push on, you just want to get this inside edge, just like the toward the, the side of the edge toward the rim. You don't have to worry about the inside carcass of the tire. So that's about it for there. Now on the bat on the uh, opposite side, you want to actually get the inside carcass of the tire and that flat surface of the bead, not the outside of the bead, just the flat surface of the bead that goes toward the rim. And again, about two thirds. Of the tire you don't really need to put it all the way around i mean you can but it's just a huge waste of lubrication now over here on the last like the two o'clock to the four o'clock position i will put a little extra on because that is the last spot that will get pushed on so let me wipe this lubric lube off my fingers here the first side is pretty simple it's just push it on Kind of walk it back and forth and it should drop right into place the second side use the uh, mounting bar and i always put a little of this lube on these mounting studs for the bar should have done that before i wipe my hands off wipe my hands off again here just so i can get some good grip on some stuff here and you also use this little, they call it the yellow thing, keeper tool. That's what you get started on the far side. So I always go to my four o'clock position as the last position. And then you get these little other nubs from the mounting bar started. Just kind of push it over as far as it lets you. Tighten that down. I'm going the opposite side here and I just kind of walk it with my hip. Kind of keep the drop center down on the wheel of the tire. If it pops up, just push it down and that's it. Front tires are easier than rears. I also took this tire out and sat it in the sun for the last 45 minutes or so. That helps uh, get them dropped down on there as well. Take it out of my clamp and I will find my air chuck. So I will use this one. And I will more or less overfill this to get this bead seated. It shouldn't go over like 45, 50 pounds, but sometimes it takes a little more than that. I don't know how cold the tire is. It, listen for two pops there's one two so she's beaded at 40 pounds i'm gonna take her up to 45 and then i'll just back the pressure off after i mount her on the bike i'm not sure if it does anything but i like to over inflate it when i mount them let that tire fully envelop onto that rim stretch out what have you and then i'll adjust the pressure later and it's easier to adjust the pressure later when they're overinflated. Because now you don't have to add air. You're just bleeding some air off. So, wipe off this excess lube. 
I'm gonna go ahead and put my cap on just so I don't lose it. It's just a basic cap. I don't do these novelty bullcrap caps. Get the rim cleaned up on both sides. Double check that the tire rotation is going the proper way. That way. Always go by what the tire tells you to rotate because especially these front tires, people think they're on backwards. The most front tires when you mount them look like they're on backwards, but they are not. So go by what the tire says. All right, I'm also gonna take this opportunity to check the bearings, clean out the uh, seals here. I always put a little bit of grease in the seals just to keep any water out. So I'm not gonna do that on the video because I'm just gonna make a mess. I'm just gonna check the bearings with my fingers, make sure it rotates, make sure there's no crunchiness, tighten, everything's tight. I'm gonna clean out these seals. Use a little more, just a little axle grease in there, high temp, red grease, whatever you got on hand. See that seal got popped out a little bit. These are original seals on this bike and I haven't had any issues with bearing failure. So putting this little bit of grease down in there to help seal them up, I think has saved my bacon up to this point. It's always the first time though. So I'm not gonna cover that. I'm just gonna pause it and do all that. And then I'll show you how to balance these tires. All right, I'm not gonna go in a super lot of detail on how this works. This is a static balance static tire balancer so all you're doing is finding the heavy spot of the tire so you gonna loosen that up you install this uh might as well just call it an axle it goes into the bearings of the wheels nice and tight or it still spins and then the top of this Tire balancer stand also has bearings that spin. So you got multiple axes that spin. And all you're doing is sticking it on here, letting it rotate, and letting the tire find its heaviest spot. So a lot of guys will remove all the weights from their wheel when they're uh, mounting a tire. I will not because usually you're balancing, most tires are fairly well balanced from the factory. And usually you're just balancing the wheel itself. So once the wheel is fairly balanced, usually you don't have to change a whole lot after the fact. Plus if you leave the weights on there, now you're in a situation like where I am right now, where I'm just removing weights. Got my little pry stick here. Just kind of letting it find its spot, let it rock back and forth. Maybe give it a, just a little nudge here and there. But I have three, four weights right here on this spot, right where it's the heaviest. So now I'm going to remove a weight and see if that's still the heaviest spot. So my weights are now right here, I'll, and it's traveling down. The weights I have on there are traveling downhill. So what I'll do is I'll put it back over here. The weights are now over here. The weights are still traveling downhill. So just to speed up this process, you can just find your heaviest spot. I mean, there's some slight movement there. I'm sure the camera's not picking that up. Still traveling that way. I'll go ahead and remove one more of these weights. And you're not going for perfection here. You're never going to get this thing perfectly balanced. See now it's almost stopped. It's kind of going the other way a little bit. I'm pretty happy with that. Ideally, what you want is you want to be able to stick the tire in any position, you know, maybe check it every 15 degrees or, you know, 45 degrees or so, and it shouldn't move. 
Some guys don't even balance their tires. I know a lot of guys, especially sporty bike guys, they just slap them on there and go. Because as the tire wears, it will kind of self-balance per se. Now, if you want to get particular about it, you can put it on a spin balancer, electronic that checks the side wobble or whatever. But you're talking a tire that's only, you know, a few inches wide. You're not going to, you're not going to feel that like you would in a car. So, yeah, I'm happy with that. And that's it. That's uh, how we mount and balance our own tires with an Omar tire changer. This, uh, this balancer is also Nomar. It all came in a kit. I think it was their ultimate kit. I can't quote you on pricing on that. I mean, I've had this thing for eight or 10 years. I think back then the whole kit was like $700. I'm sure they're quite a bit more expensive now, but that's about what it was then. So yeah, I think I'm uh, pretty much done with the tire. I'll get it mounted back on the bike, put the brakes all back together. I uh, got the wheel back up here, got the spacers back in. They're both the same size on both sides, so really can't put them on the wrong side. Clean your spacers. They're probably full of muck and gunk from the road, so clean those really well. Uh, if you put some lubricant on the uh, seals, like I told you I was going to do on the wheel stand, you shouldn't need to put any on those spacers. There's plenty on those seals. And the axle isn't required to be lubricated, but I more or less just put a coating on it I mean just a just a shine like it more or less just made it shiny just helps assist getting it in and out a little easier just like uh, installing it it's just the opposite get everything lined up I need to bring the bike down a hair oh I got a little crooked on the spot on that side started on that side always twist it in by hand you got to force it there's a reason you're forcing it you don't want to do that I've had to replace that nut already it's quite the expensive nut And obviously the right way to do everything is torque up to torque everything up to spec. Look up the torque specs. I've done this so many times that I've just I'm not saying I got a my I'm not saying my elbows calibrated for it, but if you don't use too big of a wrench, like I've got a three eighths <clears throat> got a three eighths ratchet on here. It's only what 10 inches the chances that i over torque that uh, axle with that are pretty slim i mean it might be slightly over torqued but you're not gonna cause any damage same way with the pinch bolts i'm sure there's some torque spec for it but i'm just using a quarter drive actually a little composite quarter drive i'd like to think that this little, this little Harbor Freight ratchet will give up its ghost before I over torque these bolts. Go back and forth on your pinch bolts. Get them evenly, evenly pinched up. But like I said, I think that's going to do it, guys. This, this video is going to be long enough. I am nowhere near done with this bike, but that's going to be it with this video. So I will make a part two where I show up the finished finished job on doing these this front wheel and I still need to do a uh, oil change do the service on that rear axle drive shaft anyway but that's going to be it for this one guys again thank you for subscribing thank you for making that happen for me um, this is just me out in the garage it's, I'm nobody special I'm not rich I'm not a mechanic I've learned all this myself I've become an expert on this bike over the last more than a decade of owning it and uh, yeah you too you can do it too become a YouTube mechanic research things get the service manual 
listen to recommendations from other folks on what they've done. There's plenty of information out there on these bikes, as well as all the other bikes, especially the KLR and the uh, Indian Scouts. There's a lot of stuff out there on those. Not hard to work on, it's just nuts and bolts and parts. You can do it too. But uh, thanks a lot, guys. Ride safe out there. Be careful. Peace out. We'll see you in the next one.